The doctrines of Europe, Jefferson wrote, were that men in numerous associations cannot be restrained within the limits of order and justice, except by forces physical and moral wielded over them by authorities independent of their will. We, the founders of the new American democracy, believe that man was a rational animal, endowed by nature with rights and with an innate sense of justice, and that he could be restrained from wrong and protected in right by moderate powers, confided to persons of his own choice and held to their duties by dependence on his own will. To post-Freudian ears, this kind of language seems touchingly quaint and ingenuous. Human beings are a good deal less rational and innately just than the optimists of the 18th century supposed. On the other hand, they are neither so morally blind nor so hopelessly unreasonable as the pessimists of the 20th century would have us believe. In spite of the id and the unconscious, in spite of endemic neurosis and the prevalence of low IQs, most men and women are probably decent enough and sensible enough to be trusted with the direction of their own destinies. Democratic institutions are devices for reconciling social order with individual freedom and initiative, and for making the immediate power of a country's rulers subject to the ultimate power of the ruled. The fact that, in Western Europe and America, these devices have worked, all things considered, not too badly, is proof enough that the 18th century optimists were not entirely wrong. Given a fair chance, human beings can govern themselves, and govern themselves better, though perhaps with less mechanical efficiency, than they can be governed by authorities independent of their will. Given a fair chance, I repeat, for the fair chance is an indispensable prerequisite. No people that passes abruptly from a state of subservience under the rule of a despot to the completely unfamiliar state of political independence can be said to have a fair chance of making democratic institutions work. Again, no people in a precarious economic condition has a fair chance of being able to govern themselves democratically. Liberalism flourishes in an atmosphere of prosperity and declines as declining prosperity makes it necessary for the government to intervene ever more frequently and drastically in the affairs of its subjects. Overpopulation and overorganization are two conditions which, as I have already pointed out, deprive a society of a fair chance of making democratic institutions work effectively. We see, then, that there are certain historical, economic, demographic, and technological conditions which make it very hard for Jefferson's rational animals, endowed by nature with inalienable rights and with an innate sense of justice, to exercise their reason, claim their rights, and act justly within a democratically organized society. We in the West have been supremely fortunate in having been given our fair chance of making the great experiment in self-government. Unfortunately, it now looks as though, owing to recent changes in our circumstances, this infinitely precious fair chance were being, little by little, taken away from us. And this, of course, is not the whole story. These blind impersonal forces are not the only enemies of individual liberty and democratic institutions. There are also forces of another, less abstract character, forces that can be deliberately used by power-seeking individuals whose aim is to establish partial or complete control over their fellows. Fifty years ago, when I was a boy, it seemed completely evident that the bad old days were over, that torture and massacre slavery and the persecution of heretics were things of the past. Among people who wore top hats, traveled in trains, and took a bath every morning, such horrors were simply out of the question. After all, we were living in the 20th century. A few years later, these people who took daily baths and went to church in top hats were committing atrocities on a scale undreamed of by the benighted Africans and Asiatics. In the light of recent history, it would be foolish to suppose that this sort of thing cannot happen again. It can, and 
no doubt it will. But in the immediate future, there is some reason to believe that the punitive methods of 1984 will give place to the reinforcements and manipulations of Brave New World. There are two kinds of propaganda. Rational propaganda, in favor of action that is consonant with the enlightened self-interest of those who make it, and those to whom it is addressed, and non-rational propaganda, that is not consonant with anybody's enlightened self-interest, but is dictated by, and appeals to, passions, blind impulses, unconscious cravings, or fears. Where the actions of individuals are concerned, these are motives more exalted than enlightened self-interest, but where collective action has to be taken in the fields of politics and economics, enlightened self-interest is probably the highest of effective motives. If politicians and their constituents always acted to promote their own or their country's long-range self-interest, this world would be an earthly paradise. As it is, they often act against their own interests, merely to gratify their least creditable passions. The world, in consequence, is a place of misery. Propaganda in favor of action that is consonant with enlightened self-interest appeals to reason by means of logical arguments based upon the best available evidence, fully and honestly set forth. Propaganda in favor of action dictated by the impulses that are below self-interest offers false, garbled, or incomplete evidence, avoids logical argument, and seeks to influence its victims by the mere repetition of catchwords, by the furious denunciation of foreign or domestic scapegoats, and by cunningly associating the lowest passions with the highest ideals, so that atrocities are perpetrated in the name of God, and the most cynical kind of real politic becomes a matter of religious principle and patriotic duty. In John Dewey's words, quote, a renewal of faith in common human nature, in its potentialities in general, and in its power in particular to respond to reason and truth, is a surer bulwark against totalitarianism than a demonstration of material success or a devout worship of special legal and political forms." Unquote. The power to respond to reason and truth exists in all of us. But so, unfortunately, does the tendency to respond to unreason and falsehood, particularly in those cases where the falsehood evokes some enjoyable emotion, or where the appeal to unreason strikes some answering chord in the primitive, subhuman depths of our being. In certain fields of activity, men have learned to respond to reason and truth pretty consistently. The authors of learned articles do not appeal to the passions of their fellow scientists and technologists. They set forth what, to the best of their knowledge, is the truth about some particular aspect of reality. They use reason to explain the facts they have observed, and they support their points of view with arguments that appeal to reason in other people. All this is fairly easy in the fields of physical science and technology. It is much more difficult in the fields of politics and religion and ethics. Here the relevant facts often elude us. As for the meaning of the facts, that of course depends upon the particular system of ideas in terms of which you choose to interpret them. And these are not the only difficulties that confront the rational truth seeker. In public and in private life, it often happens that there is simply no time to collect the relevant facts or to weigh their significance. We are forced to act on insufficient evidence and by a light considerably less steady than that of logic. With the best will in the world, we cannot always be completely truthful or consistently rational. All that is in our power is to be as truthful and rational as circumstances permit us to be, and to respond as well as we can to the limited truth and imperfect reasonings offered for our consideration by others. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, said Jefferson, quote, it expects what never was and never will be. The people cannot be safe without information. Where the press is free and every man able to read, all is safe. Across the Atlantic, another passionate believer in reason was thinking, about the same time, 
in almost precisely similar terms. Here is what John Stuart Mill wrote of his father, the utilitarian philosopher James Mill. Quote, so complete was his reliance upon the influence of reason over the minds of mankind, whenever it is allowed to reach them, that he felt as if all would be gained if the population were able to read, and if all sorts of opinions were allowed to be addressed to them by word or in writing, and if by the suffrage they could nominate a legislature to give effect to the opinions they had adopted." Unquote. All is safe. All would be gained. Once more we hear the note of 18th century optimism. Jefferson, it is true, was a realist as well as an optimist. He knew by bitter experience that the freedom of the press can be shamefully abused. Nothing, he declared, can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. And yet, he insisted, and we can only agree with him, quote, Within the pale of truth, the press is a noble institution, equally the friend of science and civil liberty, unquote. Mass communication, in a word, is neither good nor bad. It is simply a force, and, like any other force, it can be used either well or ill. Used in one way, the press, the radio, and the cinema are indispensable to the survival of democracy. Used in another way, they are among the most powerful weapons in the dictator's armory. In the field of mass communications, as in almost every other field of enterprise, technological progress has hurt the little man and helped the big man. As lately as 50 years ago, every democratic country could boast of a great number of small journals and local newspapers. Thousands of country editors expressed thousands of independent opinions. Somewhere or other, almost anybody could get almost anything printed. Today, the press is still legally free, but most of the little papers have disappeared. The cost of wood pulp, of modern printing machinery, and of syndicated news is too high for the little man. In the totalitarian East, there is political censorship, and the media of mass communications are controlled by the state. In the democratic West, there is economic censorship, and the media of mass communications are controlled by members of the power elite. Censorship by rising costs and concentration of communication power in the hands of a few big concerns is less objectionable than state ownership and government propaganda, but certainly it is not something of which a Jeffersonian Democrat could possibly approve. In regard to propaganda, the early advocates of universal literacy and a free press envisaged only two possibilities. The propaganda might be true or it might be false. They did not foresee what in fact has happened, above all in our Western capitalist democracies the development of a vast mass communications industry, concerned in the main neither with the true nor the false, but with the unreal, the more or less totally irrelevant. In a word, they failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In the past, most people never got a chance of fully satisfying this appetite. They might long for distractions, but the distractions were not provided. Christmas came but once a year. Feasts were solemn and rare. There were few readers and very little to read. And the nearest approach to a neighborhood movie theater was the parish church, where the performances, though frequent, were somewhat monotonous. For conditions even remotely comparable to those now prevailing, we must return to Imperial Rome where the populace was kept in good humor by frequent, gratuitous doses of many kinds of entertainment, from poetical dramas to gladiatorial fights, from recitations of Virgil to all-out boxing, from concerts to military reviews and public executions. But even in Rome, there was nothing like the non-stop distraction now provided by newspapers and magazines, by radio, television, and the cinema. In Brave New World, non-stop distractions of the most fascinating nature, the feelies, orgy-porgy, centrifugal bumble-puppy, are deliberately used as instruments of policy 
for the purpose of preventing people from paying too much attention to the realities of the social and political situation. The other world of religion is different from the other world of entertainment, but they still resemble one another in being most decidedly not of this world. Both are distractions, and, if lived in too continuously, both can become, in Marx's phrase, the opium of the people, and so a threat to freedom. Only the vigilant can maintain their liberties, and only those who are constantly and intelligently on the spot can hope to govern themselves effectively by democratic procedures. A society, most of whose members spend a great part of their time not on the spot, not here and now and in the calculable future, but somewhere else, in the irrelevant other worlds of sport and soap opera, of mythology and metaphysical fantasy, will find it hard to resist the encroachments of those who would manipulate and control it. In their propaganda, today's dictators rely for the most part on repetition, suppression, and rationalization. The repetition of catchwords, which they wish to be accepted as true, the suppression of facts, which they wish to be ignored, the arousal and rationalization of passions, which may be used in the interests of the party or the state. As the art and science of manipulation come to be better understood, the dictators of the future will doubtless learn to combine these techniques with the non-stop distractions which, in the West, are now threatening to drown in a sea of irrelevance the rational propaganda essential to the maintenance of individual liberty and the survival of democratic institutions.